Kevin, thanks for coming on the show, man. Thanks for having me, dude. Yeah, no problem. All right, so um, here you got this. Is I'm going to talk about how you got my attention, but then we'll talk a little bit about your background and and all that. But I'm going to read a tweet that you have pinned. Um, and your great Twitter account, by the way. Thank um, you. Here's what you said. Uh, you said I was wrong about lockdowns and mandates. I was wrong, and the reasons I was wrong was my tribalism, my emotions, and my distorted understanding of human nature and of the virus. It doesn't matter much, but I wanted to apologize for being wrong. Now, you really got my attention with this. Now, I had known who you were before because you, you comment somewhat on nutrition and, and health, um, but this really got my attention. Then I went down, the, you know, down the, the, the rabbit hole of some of the stuff you wrote, and then you wrote this article in Newsweek, which we'll get into, which was amazing. But let's back up a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about your background. Let's start there, and then we'll, we'll move forward. Yeah. Um, as people know, I'm an MD, PhD student, but it started, uh, I started first becoming interested in medicine whenever I was in high school. I actually wasn't a great student, but uh, I had medical problems, and um, that first piqued my interest. Uh, thankfully, I was good at standardized tests. I went to a good school, so I did well on standardized tests. It took a year to do uh, like a community college, and then I got into UT Austin. I only, I only went there because um, like some uh, pretty girls I knew went there also from high school <laughs> that's a good reason. and, and all, that's like all I was interested in and all I knew. So I applied there. I didn't apply anywhere else. And I got in, I was like, wow, that's great. I got in, uh, didn't uh, date any of those girls, but, uh, yeah, but I got into UT Austin. So that, so that's a good thing. Um, yeah, I did well there, uh, uh, studied anthropology and biology partly because, uh, I was like into paleo diet. So I liked anthropology uh because i wanted to learn like what's the truth of the paleo diet like maybe we should all live like our ancestors without technology and without shoes and stuff what's your thought on that now uh <laughs> <laughs> well, i mean like, has that shifted i mean did you think that way completely and then it changed your mind or are you more uh, you confirmed the bias like how do you feel about it uh well, actually, in college, uh, I think they taught us that, like, yeah, our ancestors did live, like, perfect, beautiful lives and with perfect equality between everybody and all sorts of bullshit. Um, <laughs> That's true. <laughs> like, we, <laughs> we really did learn. We, we, we learned, like, woke anthropology. Um, but, uh, yeah, later on, of course, I realized, you know, like, we can't, we can't do that. Like, we can't go back to live like our ancestors. So uh, it's foolish to even... Consider it. Also, I mean, we could go, we could go on intellectual tangents, but like, also we've evolved to some degree to live like modern people, you know, evolution happens over even relatively short periods of time. So even in terms of dietary met metabolic evolution. So, uh, in a certain sense, biologically, we can't fully go back and be that. And there's also no going back anyway. Like there's so many different, anth there's so many different like anthropological periods. There's so many different like cavemen there's not one kind of caveman we have this idea of like a caveman who like runs around chases yeah, I, mammoths it's I, you not know true. I, I think there's some truth right in and how we evolved over history uh or over time but i also think that we tend to which it makes me laugh is we tend to um look back and we paint this super rosy picture and we don't really we're not quite honest about uh what it was really like like if you if you find bones from, you know, humans, you know, a hundred thousand years ago is like spear marks and yeah. broken skulls. And yes. We, Holes in their skulls. Yeah. Yes. And we, and we, we, we rape Neanderthals and we <laughs> just, that's true, right? Yes. So, yes. Brutal. so yeah. it's like, okay, there was, okay. We, I think there's some truth there, but there's a lot of truth in also how we have progressed. And I don't think it's like black or white, you know? Right. I think we project our own fantasies onto those people and we ignore everything else. Yeah. Like that's not savory. So we'll pick one anthropological tribe to study in say college. And that's the anthropological tribe that matches the ideological biases of the professor. And that's what we got taught. <laughs> so yeah. do you remember what, like that unfolding for you? Cause I mean, I totally believe that and agree with you, but do you remember like that kind of aha moment that you had when you started to realize, wait a second, like this seems, this too is romanticized. Yeah. This is way too. Well, I think I had, I, I realized the entire time that while I was being indoctrinated through, through, through much of college. I, so you I, were aware. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. Before I started college, I was like reading other things and, and yeah, I was aware. That doesn't mean I wasn't affected. That doesn't mean I wasn't indoctrinated. Despite the fact I was aware, I was completely like woke by the end of college. Wow. Because you're just exposed to it all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And also the opportunities, everything else, uh, sort of in the future, the people who are, who are doing great things in the field, et cetera, they're all the same way. You're like, they're great. And also there's great things to be said about people who, um, pursue certain ideas along those lines. For example, like one of the, uh, one of the doctors who I really admired for a long time, uh, 
his name was Paul Farmer. He went to Haiti. He, has, he made hospitals. He saved so many like Haitians' lives, maybe hundreds of thousands of Haitians' lives. Uh, of course, he was like far, le- like kind of far left. Uh, people who are far left love him. He's kind of like one of the idols among mm. people who t- are in the academic far left. But yet, he did like amazing, great things. So just because somebody's like woke doesn't necessarily, you know, mean they're so because because he was like that. I kind of um, I kind of emulated or wanted to be like him yeah. for. Today's giveaway is the RGB bundle, MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment under this very controversial episode uh, in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Also, subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. Do all those things, and if you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. We're also running a sale on two workout programs, MAPS Anabolic and MAPS Split, both 50% off. If you're interested in either one or both of them, just click on the link at the top of the description below. By the way, I look forward to the comments and the discussions in the comment section. So here comes the show. Example. See, this is why I appreciate you, Kevin, mm-hmm. um, because uh, I really appreciate people that can be objective. And I think a, a hallmark of someone who's not objective is they'll take a position and then they'll take all the potent, like all the positions that are connected to it or, or people say are supposed to be connected to it and they just adopt all of it. So it's mm-hmm. like, this is true, so I'm going to believe all this other stuff. And there's no like, wait, let me break this down. Although this person was right here, that doesn't mean they're right about everything. And that's really lacking. And what I find, like, again, what I like about you is, um, well, I mean, a couple of different things. One is you, you're very objective, so you can do that. And then two is your your ability, which is rare nowadays, to be like, hey, I was wrong here. Here's Here's now why I think, why I've changed my mind, even though... This is going to cause potentially a lot of problems for me. Yeah, I try to be objective. Um, you say that I'm objective. Like the reason I'm saying these things now is partly like as a result of struggling to be objective and failing so many times. And I'm still going to keep like messing up and having points of view that are wrong. But I'm just constantly trying to learn more and correct uh, the things that I, I'm getting wrong. Um, uh, yeah. And about the second part. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, look, we're all... I don't know. I'm going to get morbid here, but we're all like, we're all going to die. Right. (laughs) Like what kind of life do you want to live? Like, do you want to live a life where you, uh, like lie to people and, or you lie to yourself, uh, so that people like you and so that you become like successful. Is that the kind of life you want to live? And then you die and that's what you left behind. Basically a bunch of lies. You convince people a bunch of things that aren't true. Or do you want to like tell people the truth, sometimes take your hits. And then when you die, you left behind something that was true and will help people out uh, later. And so I think that that's, I want to do the thing that's harder uh, because like, I know, I know I'm going to die. Like I'm trying to do the thing and to leave that thing behind. That's good. Have you always been that way? Uh, like, yeah, that's developed over time. Uh, in college, I was exposed to some ideas about like death and stuff. And then it's taken me, you know, over the next last like 15 years or so to, to really, um, but have I always been on? Yeah. I think also, yeah, I think I'm also maybe congenitally tend to be honest. Like my mom is that way. She can't lie. She has a hard time lying. Um, my daughter is that way. My younger daughter is that way. She'll like say the worst things in the world to me, <laughs> like talk about my appearance, all sorts of other things. <laughs> she's not, she's not trying to Dad, you should mean. take a shower. <laughs> they do stuff like that. So, um, hopefully, hopefully they don't get that beaten out of them. I know they will to some degree, but I'm going to also, you know, teach them to keep carrying that on because, you know. I think, but it is part of maybe my, my makeup, my disposition mm. as well. Now, what, what got you to then go to medical school and, and what type of medicine are you pursuing? Yeah. So I was, I was very like woke after medical school. I thought like medicine oppressed people and hurt everybody. Like it, it's hard to really, uh, so there's, there's, there's these two authors. Some people might be familiar with them. One is Ivan Illich and one is like, people have heard of Foucault, Michel Foucault. Yeah. Basically like medicine is this oppressive structure that, um, like, that takes advantage of people or in the case of Ivan Illich, it like takes health, the health of people who are in like well-developed or affluent societies. And then it, um, like uses that health to uh, like give drugs to profit, et cetera. Yeah. And actually takes away the health through medicine. Uh, it's just these insane Weird, ideas. Distorted view. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I had some, uh, these are like exaggerations, but I had something kind of like these kinds of ideas. And I was, I just didn't want to participate in the system of, healthcare because I thought I was like an oppressor or something or part of an oppressive system. But then like, I realized that, um, you know, even if there are problems with medicine and healthcare, like 
you can still help one person at a time. I can still make one small difference, even though I can't like overthrow all the bad things that are the case in the world. Like there's so many oppressive structures, et cetera. I can still like help one person at a time and have a meaningful life that way. Otherwise, like I was maybe 26 or 27 at that point. I just didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I was like so negative about the world. Like I was, I was pretty depressed at this point because I was so negative about the world, partly because of what I learned in college for, for real. Um, and then I just at some point said, okay, do I want to like live or do I not want to live? Like, do I want to live in this world or do I not? And then I decided like, okay, fine. I can find some meaning through day-to-day -day interactions with patients. And, uh, over time, my views have become like less, <laughs> like tremendously less like negative about the world, but I had a very radicalized, uh, view about, uh, like it was just all terrible, uh, mm -hmm. about the world. So that, so then, yeah, that's when I decided to, to try to pursue medicine. I did well on the MCAT. I like got a 99th percentile score, um, interviewed at a bunch of different places. Uh, I was still kind of like radical at this point. Like I still kind of like didn't know if like medicine was like a good thing for people or whatever. And this isn't something I talk about a lot actually, but, uh, yeah, but then I like I still got into med school because I got along with some of the interviewers, or whatever. So, mm. it's and what, what type what type of medicine are you pursuing? I was thinking about doing so. There's a dual dual residency called Med Psych Medicine and Psychiatry. It's basically two oh, residencies at the same time. Um, it's four years. It's five years instead of four years. Psych could be just four years. Uh, I just want to do like I like I wanted to do psych, but I also love medicine. I don't know if I can leave behind medicine itself. So. Yeah. Oh, very interesting. Okay, so so let's get back now uh, to your tweet. Let's talk a little bit about how you felt and what your ideas were uh, or your opinions were about um, the pandemic and our approach with the pandemic and some of the policies that we passed. Let's take me back to that time and how you felt about what was going on. And then we'll get to like what got you to write that tweet and, and then that Newsweek article that I think was so, so well written. Um, at that moment, well, it is important to like bring together. Okay. So we can talk about that particular tweet. Yeah. I just realized that, um, well, like one of the things that I thought we should have done during COVID. And this is, I literally believe this stupid stuff. Like I thought we should like, I really loved what China was doing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's, it's, it's hard to, it's, I mean, it's really, um, I think now there's a lot of people, by the way, there were a lot of people who agreed with you who now will not admit that they said that. <laughs> so what you're saying right now is it's like, again, that's why I appreciate you. Yeah. Cause I, there's people now, public people, Oh, I never said that. Like, we got it on camera, buddy. You thought we should do this exact thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, you know, they're ruthless. I mean, basically they did whatever they needed to do to get rid of the pandemic. So if, if you were going to leave your apartment and you could potentially spread the disease, we're going to weld you into your apartment. I thought that that was like, I thought that was cool because they would do whatever they needed to do to stop and I thought the most important thing was human health. There's nothing that's more important than life and health. Like right. what, what's more important than life, life and health. There are some other things that are happen to be important and that I, I started to recognize later on, but like, if those are the most important things, then yeah, you need to do what's the most important thing to, you need to do whatever you need to do to, uh, stop people from dying. Mm -hmm. So I thought China was great. And, uh, but then at some point I realized like, look, we're not going to be like China. And even, and, and I was actually talking to people from China and the situation in China was terrible. Like nobody, nobody loved like living in, under lockdown all the time. They kept getting locked down over and over. I know people who are in China, like the virus would start spreading in their neighborhood after they hit a certain threshold of cases or whatever. They, the whole, the whole like district would get locked down completely. Like, I don't know if you guys saw the videos of like people literally running yeah, like, to try yeah. to, to try to get out before the lockdowns happened. Uh, and I just started to realize first off, we're not going to become like China. And if we became like China, that would be terrible. Like ch it's terrible in China. And then, and then it's even worse. Like over the last like a uh, couple months, they unlocked down, like they removed lockdowns and like millions of people died. Apparently like yeah. the, r the real figures aren't released, but I know people again in China, apparently like millions of people die, like hundreds of thousands a day, stuff like that. It was crazy. Yeah, you know, Kevin, let me, let me pause you for a second. Cause you, you said something that I a hundred percent agree with, but I also think our view of this particular thing is, is can tend to be extremely narrow. So I agree with the statement that health is what is one of the most important things without health. I mean, what do you have? Okay. But here's where I think it's narrow is we view, we viewed health as 
a very narrow uh, infection, illness, death. Sure. We did not consider how complex human health is, which includes psychological, psychological health, mental health, spiritual health, your relationships, all of which, if are poor, will cause a decline in your physical health, which now we have all the evidence that, uh, that that's exactly what ended up happening. But I mean, I knew this because I work in the fitness industry. There was this famous study that, that I think Stanford might have been Stanford or Harvard that that did where they showed that having poor relationships was bad for your health. It's yeah. like smoking yeah, yeah, yeah. 10 cigarettes a day. And so what happened is, and this is hindsight for a lot of people, but for, for us, it was quite clear. <laughs> we took uh, infectious disease specialists and we said, hey, you guys create the policy. Yep. We're not going to ask psychologists, econo e economists. We're not going to ask people who understand human behavior or children, child behavior. Um, yeah. We're just like, it what reduces infection. Let's just do that. And then nothing else matters. And that, that is the science. That perspective is the science. Right, right. Yeah. Right. So that was all happening. You're like, let's do it. We need to do this. At what point during that time, we're like, oh, wait a minute. This is, this is not the right approach. Yeah. I mean, it's whenever I started like, a, so to go, it's important to like explain the history. So whenever I got into medical school, I saw that uh, like doctors are good people. Like everybody's trying to do a good thing. There's problems. So I became much more moderate. So I went from being like a, a left-wing extremist to like very much a centrist thinking, yeah, there's problems with the system, but you iteratively improve them. Um, and then, uh, and then my perspective became once I got into the social media, that there are people who are saying things that were like wrong about health, wrong about, you know, fitness, wrong about, um, diet, nutrition on Instagram, on Twitter, et cetera. And we needed to correct these people to, to make sure that uh, people had the right information. And then I took a very like pro-establishment perspective, like the establishment is basically right. Everybody's trying to basically do the right thing. And then it's other people who are criticizing the establishment who are the bad guys. And I got so like involved in this perspective that I couldn't, that I stopped being able to see to a certain extent many times, like how we were actually doing things that were wrong sometimes. Mm. So during the COVID pandemic, I was unable to see that. But then when I started creating some of my own content, uh, like, telling people, okay, here's what the science says about X, Y, and Z. Here's what you should do as a result of that. I started getting debunked. So I used to be like this big debunker. I had like this thing called the quack list. I would like have lists of names and stuff. It was, it was crazy what I used to do, but I used to debunk like huge amounts of people. Then I started ge getting debunked by the people who like were supposed to be like my friends. Mm -hmm. And then I started realizing, What's the hey, first well, example of that. First example of that. Um, well, do you guys know Spencer Nad Nadolski? Oh yeah, yeah. yes, yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah, he he like really hated my content. Like he, <laughs> he's like, you're just a student. Like, what are you talking about? But I was right. Like, oh, a really good first example was uh, sunscreen. So mm. there was this really good FDA study published in like 2019, published by like all the people in a particular part of the FDA that were involved in this question, and they were like MD PhDs, great scientists, etc showing that whenever you applied the chemical sunscreen to your skin, it got absorbed into the bloodstream. And then you could detect it several days out above the threshold of the level at which uh, it might raise alarms for potential toxicity. Mm. Uh, that was published by the FDA. And some of these levels were really, really high for chemical sunscreen. Um, now it didn't show that it necessarily caused harm. And I was like very clear, it's not showing that, but it's it's above the- I think What the, they consider to be harmful. What, mm. what they consider to be above the threshold for concern for future study. Got it. So they ended up doing a bunch of other studies and they're still doing these studies based on uh, those detection levels. But they said, hey, you know, um, there's something potentially uh, risky here. So all I did was report that. I reported exactly that way. And then I was interpreted as saying that chemical sunscreen was risky. A chemical sunscreen is going to cause you harm. All I said that is that we don't know right now because we mm. have this evidence gap that the FDA itself is recognizing that we have an evidence gap about. And there's these other sunscreens called mineral sunscreens that you can that you can wear and you don't have to deal with this problem. And other people are talking about this. So I just want to address this and clarify this for people so that mm. people understand the issue that's here. Seems very balanced and rational. Right. To totally. And then and then the like so some crazy people from uh like I think they love like chemicals and they from love copper tone <laughs> for real, dude. <laughs> the <laughs> copper tone scientist. Dude, came. <laughs> dude, I think they might be, I don't know what they are, but they're volunteers. They might be paid by the, whatever, but they're zealots. They're like anybody who like says anything negative. How, what's a good example of this? Um, they polarize in the opposite direction. So there's all these crazy people online who are like natural living people who are like all chemicals are bad, et right. cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So then there's a whole nother group of people who's like dedicated to fighting these natural 
you yeah. know, and like debunking them. Wow. So this whole group of people who's dedicated to fighting, debunking them, like I came into the to the story and they're like, oh, you're a natural living person. Like they're, they just polarize like a cult. And then they try to debunk me without even like listening to what they weren't even so able to just understand. They put you in that box. Exactly. So that's what they did. They put me in that box. They like, it was the weirdest exchange I've ever had. We had like this public confrontation is so strange because it was clear, like they weren't listening to what I was saying and they just wanted to like pretend I was crazy. Mm. It was, it, and, it, and it was trauma. It was like almost traumatizing for me because I had spent so much time like building identity online uh, as like a debunker, as somebody who was like uh, pro science, et cetera. And then I was being called like a charlatan. I was being called like all these terrible things. And then like people who I respected were unfriending me and blocking me and stuff. I was like, what, what wow. the hell is going on? Like yeah. what's wrong with these <laughs> <Wow>. people? <laughs> like, it, yeah, it was like yeah. a cult. So, um, did that give you a, a new perspective? Yes. Well, that was like the beginning. Well, that, and like another thing about like animal products and veganism. And like, oh, I got God. mobbed by the vegans who were also, I was, I am, like I have a plant-based oriented perspective. Uh, I, I support a lot of the things that they do. And then, so whenever they did that to me, I was like, what's wrong with you people, you know? <laughs> and I, and it, part of it's because I like, there are these boxes, there are these like tribes online, but I like, one of the things you mentioned is you like that I like try to be objective, but being objective also gets you in trouble. Totally. You know? Yeah. So it's, <laughs> oh, it's, yeah. it's dangerous. Especially it's, if you tell other people they need to be objective, which <laughs> I've done a lot of. Yeah. Yeah. I, okay. So this takes us to human behavior, which um, it is our nature to try to put things into clean black and white boxes. It's very hard for humans to understand uh, nuance. nuance and grayness. It's either you're good or you're bad. You're good or evil. This is right or wrong. Um, it's never. It's so challenging for people to be like, well, there's some truth in what this person's saying. Not all of it, but I can see some truth. And you know what? This person over here, they some of the stuff they're saying is crazy, but they're also saying some stuff that's true. That is so hard for people to do um, just across the board. So I think it's human nature. This is why you find it in medicine, fitness, in economics. I don't care, actually. You find it in every single space because- this is human nature. But you were now on the other end of this cancel mob feeling type of thing. Were you like, oh, okay, this is weird. And and did you, you obviously didn't back down. Why didn't you back down? Is it, did it, did it embolden you or did it make you scared? Like what was the deal? Oh, okay. Um, well, so I wasn't, I was ready not to back down, but like nobody like cared too much about it. Like nobody was like interested in hearing my like complex discussions about the what the different regulatory agencies said. So I just like let it go because nobody was like, I wasn't getting any engagement. I just felt at the end, I was just felt like this is, this is bullshit. Like this is, this is terrible what they like said. And I, I felt like I couldn't even say anything back. Like nobody even cared about what I was I saying. See. Um, it was a weird, it was so weird. Um, yeah. And then this happens over the course of several different times, several different cases of this where, where this sort of thing would happen and people would like DM me and say, Hey, Kevin, you need to like, like be careful about what content you post. I'm like, what are you talking about? What content I post? Like, I think they were seeing it from their perspective of like, um, like that's bad. Uh, and so other people are also going to see it's bad, but I think it's their own like cult like perspective. And so it, it just turned out that there's a lot of people around me that all have like weird, I think it's just like, almost everybody does online or something. They have like cult, like pers these group group perspectives. So yeah, uh, it just over time though, I started to become more like disconnected from like the, those, the evidence based, the online evidence based community. And by being like sort of detribalizing from that, I started to see things a little bit different, especially when people would attack me. So one of the things that was posted by, uh, by Elon was this prosecute Fauci tweet, yeah. which I thought was great. Mm. Uh, I, I loved when Elon got like, Twitter. I thought it was like the greatest thing because yep. it was a, it was a total breath of fresh air. He's a smart guy. He seemed like intelligent. Like he was going to do things. He seemed like he loved Twitter. Uh, he wanted to make it better. So I was like, I loved it. So I like retweet everything he said. I think I retweeted the prosecute Fauci. And then like, I just got like hammered in my comments when I were you're, you're encouraging people to like attack and try to murder Fauci, man. Like he's got all these guards. Now you're putting him in danger by saying these things. I'm like, dude, I just retweeted persecute Fauci or like said something positive about it. And people just like, these are intelligent people. People like with like New York Times bestsellers and like these are really intelligent people. I don't understand like how they could be so. 
I mean, the other thing I would say to them is like, look, dude, uh, you can say all sorts of different things. Does it mean you can't criticize somebody because they might get attacked by like um, somebody else because you criticize them? Like, it was just so weird, like how irrational. And then, and then I just started realizing, hey, you know, I've been like this all the time. You know, I've done this to people. I've like said, dismissed the, their, their perspective, et cetera. And I started thinking about COVID. I started thinking about like, other people had a different perspective than me whenever they were protesting lockdowns. The other people thought differently than I did. And I started trying to think about, okay, why would they think differently than me? Is it because they're ignorant? Because what I used to think, I think anybody thought different from me about COVID is ignorant or stupid or evil. Right. Literally. I literally couldn't see anything, wow. any, any other different way than that. Um, and then when people would respond, I would be like, this is crazy person responding to me, you know, or they're just like lost. I was, it was so weird thinking about it now. It's like, I dismissed them as a human. Mm. They're like, they were not a human to me. They were just some weird words coming out. It's, it's hard to even describe like how, uh, crazy this seems we, to me. Now. We lived through, yeah. um, the very honest though. Yeah. We lived through the largest in, in recorded history, in my opinion, psyop operation. Now, I'm not saying that there was like one central person in charge, but there was a lot of, um, it's very clear, and I can argue this all day long, it's very clear that there were special interests and people who either through tribalism or because they could make money or because they're protecting themselves or because of politics were would create a narrative and then the strategies were to silence. And there's lots of different ways to silence people. One is to make them look like idiots, ignorant, they're stupid. The other one is to say, if you open your mouth, you're going to hurt someone to scare them or they yes. cancel them outright. Yep, yep. yep. Um, and so it was very clear to me, there was actually a turning point for me that I've talked about many times in the show. I, I, I wonder if there was one for you, but I remember specifically there were the, uh, there was a newscast and they, in the newscast, they were talking about how you need to stay home don't be around anybody. You will kill people if you're around anybody by spraying the virus. You will literally murder people. <laughs> yeah. And then in the same newscast, and I remember when I saw this, I was like, this is peak propaganda. Mm. The same newscast, they they pan over to the George Floyd protest where there's right. thousands of yes. people packed around each other, like yelling, <sighs> spit flying, everybody, nobody's wearing a mask. And they were saying, this in no way is contributing in any significant way to the spread of the of virus. And I said, that's in those two yeah. things are not possible in the same universe. And that was a huge turning point for me. Did you have any of those where you're like, this is crazy? No, it, no, for me, it was all just like slowly breaking up this, uh, this, this shell that was locked around me that prevented me from seeing anything because I was always demonizing everybody else. Oh, mm. Once that got broken down, I progressively started seeing this crazy stuff that you're talking about. And I feel like weird not having seen it whenever, Whenever people would point this, this stuff out that you're actually, I will say, I will say that was the one time I had one of the first uh, disagreements with sort of the evidence based community was during the George Floyd thing, actually, because mm -hmm. I pointed out, um, hey, look, people can't go to church. People can't protest lockdowns, but they can go to the George Floyd thing. Also, Black Lives Matter isn't going to isn't going to change like racial inequality in the United States. That's been going on for like, you know, decades and or hundreds of years, if you want to point it that, put it that way, like you're not going to do anything by having these protests. You're just like doing the same thing. People are going to church that are doing, you're just doing it according to a different belief system. Yeah. Um, not to go down that rabbit hole, but now, you know, we know that BLM now was a huge money-making scheme, but we don't have to go down there. And so, um, I, I, I was actually accused of like, I, Oh, are you racist? Like you're not going to be able to serve your patients, yeah. all this stuff. But even at that point, I just thought, um, I just thought people, some people, some people were wrong about some things. And overall the whole, uh, lockdown thing was, or in all the COVID policy was, was done with the right intentions. And yeah. I didn't see it as a system, systemic problem until later. Um, and then, and then once I saw that, I started seeing it everywhere. I started seeing it everywhere. All of these contradictions that you're alluding to, like about masks, vaccines, like they lied about so many different things. Um, and I, you, you called a psyop or special interest. I honestly, I know a lot of people who, I don't know necessarily know the people who are in charge of CDC, but I know people who are their classmates. I know a lot of people who are at great academic institutions. I think everybody was, I think they were trying to do their best. I honestly do. I thought, I think they just like got locked into their own, 
you know, I think they were like me, most of them. Maybe there were some psychopaths that were manipulating it and pulling some strings here and there, but I think a lot of people had good intentions. That's, I, I believe, I, I that's subscribe. The, that's what makes psyops, that's what makes a psyop. I subscribe, to, I subscribe to that philosophy more. I think that- Well, uh, no, that's, that's what makes, a, so an effective psy, if you, if you study uh, like the Soviet Union and these, these you know, past um, oppressive regimes, all you need to do is, is, is plant seeds and then you let people do the rest. So I'm not saying- that you had millions of people that were part of this, you know, thing. It's literally you had a few things happening. Then you had the media, which would follow along because they're trying to get clicks. Yeah, they're trying yeah, to get we whatever. Had two distinctively different narratives going on at the same time. I remember having a conversation with my brother, who was like, literally didn't see a, a, to your point, didn't see anything that I was seeing, and I wasn't seeing anything he was seeing. And then we started discussing this and getting frustrated. Because it was just like, I, where are you getting this information? We completely had two different biases going on at the same time. Did you experience that with any of your friends and family? Yeah, especially once I wrote the Newsweek and, and I went on Tucker. I got like <laughs> excommunicated from everything. <laughs> I lost like 90, 95% of my online connections. Uh, yeah. there and, and I would try to get on the phone with them and they wouldn't be able to understand. Like I, I couldn't like explain to them. Because they would either say like, uh, th their belief was either I was a dr I was drunk on the clicks, which by the way, I wasn't, I, of course I was elated to get the attention, but like the overwhelming part of it was like this miserable sense of like, everybody hates me kind of thing. And, but I've got to do the right thing anyway. Uh, I like had like kind of a mild depression during that period. It was terrible. Uh, but they thought I was drunk on the clicks. And then once they realized I was serious, then they thought I was brainwashed. Mm. I literally, it was no way for me to get into them for them to to uh, take what I was saying seriously. Mm. They had to have some mechanism by which to dismiss it. I would, so I would love to talk to you about, mm. because you are a science-based guy um, and uh, again, objective. So you don't tend to have a bias. You're like, okay, well, here's the data. This is what it says. It was, it, it contradicts what we thought. So this must be the truth. I, I'll give you a couple examples. I'd love your opinion on them. There was one, um, and this happened either during the pandemic or shortly afterwards when it was unpopular. Okay, when it was unpopular to say, but they showed, they compared places with strict lockdowns to places with much looser lockdowns. So like, like Florida to California, for example, like those would be two ex extreme examples, right? California locked down forever, Florida two weeks and then almost wide open. And they showed, they tracking, uh, they tracked cell phone data, like the way people traveled. And what they found was in the places where they didn't have strict lockdowns, when the cases of COVID went up, people stayed home, people stopped moving. And they kind of mirrored what the lockdown places did, except it was voluntary. They didn't feel a pre like they were locked down. Business didn't feel like I have to shut down and it's being forced. It was rather like, well, this is what I'm choosing to do. And so you had similar behaviors, even though this place over here, people could do what they want, essentially. And people over here, I remember seeing that and being like, oh man, like these lockdowns are causing more harm than good because just the way people feel about them yes. more than anything. Yeah. Do you remember seeing some of that, stuff, that kind of stuff? No, but it makes sense to me because I know Sweden had a similar uh, approach yes. uh, where they, everything was voluntary. Of course, I think they limited large gatherings above like 50 at some point in 2021 above like 50 people and stuff like that. But the vast majority of the measures were voluntary and yet they have the same thing. The mobile, the mobility data, they saw it just plummet yeah. whenever you had, uh, um, you know, peaks and spikes. Yeah. I, I wonder if uh, we could have just followed more of that sort of model and achieved much the same thing, and uh, but less like, without without the less the, the fallout. Yeah, yeah that's of right. The public trust. Here's another one um, that I would love you, I would love you to comment on. Um, I when they started doing the mask mandates, so I used to work. I used to have a, a wellness studio, and I used to train a lot of doctors <laughs> and nurses. And I remember, I don't know what it was. Just this random conversation I had with this doctor, and they talked about the protocol for teaching medical students the proper ways to use a mask. And it was ridiculous. I remember like you can, you have to, you have to touch a particular way, use it once. They do this one test where they like, they, you, where you wear like a particular mask. Can you smell anything? Mm -hmm. If you can, you got it on wrong. It was like this whole ordeal. And I was like, oh my God, like there's training around wearing masks. I remember this was years ago. It was like 10 years ago, maybe longer. And then when they came out with mask mandates, I was like, nobody, <laughs> nobody in there. <laughs> nobody right knows how to do a mask protocol properly. properly. I'm like, yes. this is total waste of time. And now we have the, that Cochrane review that shows it my was. Is, losing their mind is that, this. do you think that's why the masks were largely ineffective? Because people just don't understand medical protocol and how to use them? Or was it more because it just was a waste of time? There's a million different explanations for it. But in the end, like, 
yeah, you could say it's people not adhering, not wearing them, people not wearing them all the time. They take them off whenever they're eating. You could say it's people don't wear them the right way. It's a maybe the minimum effective dose of the virus coming out of the mask is too high for the mask to make any difference in transmission. There's all sorts of, but ultimately just whatever the reason is that masks don't work, they don't work. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, so, 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 so it's like people come up with all these things. Well, in theory they should work. So you should still use them because in theory they should work. Like that's not how science works guys, but you know, that's what they were trying to do. And they're still trying to do that in the New York times and stuff. So I don't know. Yeah. Nope. It's a, um, <laughs> that's the difference between intended, uh, um, like uh, you're passing policy because of intended result and actual result. Yeah. We often do that. We'll pass a law like this law is good because it's going to do this. It's like, well, what did it do in real life? It didn't do that. <laughs> Why have this law? People, I guess, I mean, I don't know. That's it's a great point because it's almost like the drug war and all sorts of other things. That, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but people are like almost more concerned about the intention and the, the intended effect rather than, the actual data, which is a, it's a weird thing. Yeah. What about, um, the data now that's coming out? I know that some countries now are no longer allowing, um, young people, maybe just young men to get booster shots or extra doses of these MRNA vaccines. I think there's some European countries here in the U S are still advocating it for everybody all the time. Like what is the data showing on the potential risks uh, of the vaccines for, I know specifically it's like younger males is yep. what we're seeing. Yep. Like, like, like it's more, it's like more risk than reward type of deal. Am I, am I? Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, well, I don't know if it's, I, I think the risk to reward ratio is unclear uh, among like, especially young males. And there's also maybe among females, a whole nother range of potential downsides. Like, uh, like they call it dysautonomia and pots and all these other weird, I haven't looked Explain into those. That. Uh, I don't know much about it. Um, <sighs> apparently it can disrupt sort of your autonomic nervous system in ways that I don't fully, I don't understand. This is not something interesting. That, I've been focused on the myocarditis and pericarditis part of the story, but apparently there's other sides of the story as well. Um, but for me, you know, I'll, I'll tell my story because it's, it's good to clear this up. People often have a misunderstanding about this. I had, I got pericarditis probably from the vaccine. Oh, you did? Yes. Um, it was from the, so I had the two Moderna, uh, primary series. And then I had a, a Pfizer booster. I think a couple months later I had isolated pericarditis. So elevated CRP, uh, no troponin elevation. What were your symptoms? Just tight chest, like the whole, whenever I would lay down, it would felt like my head was about to pop off. Like if there was blood, like in my neck and like, it felt really weird. And then whenever I would like exert myself, it would feel like, I would feel like pain and, or like anxiety. Um, and then whenever I sat up, things were okay during most of the day was fine. And then I had like several nights in a row uh, and then it got really bad one night. And I just had to, I was like, if I have, if I have COVID myocarditis, do I have to go to the hospital? I like wrote this on Twitter. Uh, and everybody was like, what the hell dude, you go to the hospital now. It turned out like I didn't have COVID, but I had like pericarditis. What's um, the difference with myocarditis and pericarditis? So pericarditis is the sac that, uh, covers the heart. Oh, um, is inflamed. Yeah. Yeah. There's like fluid that is inside the sac that if the sac becomes too inflamed and too filled with fluid it actually stops the heart from beating because the it's called cardiac tamponade. The, the heart literally can't beat through the fluid. So it can be life threatening if it gets bad enough. Of course we have with modern surgery, you can cut the sac and drain the fluid. So people's heart is okay. But uh, pericarditis is inflammation of the heart muscle itself, uh, or sorry, myocarditis is inflammation of the heart muscle itself, which is in some ways kind of worse because if you have uh, the heart muscle gets damaged, uh, it's permanently damaged like for life. Wow. So they can look at MRIs. You can look at the heart of people who've had this kind of myocarditis and you can see permanent scar tissue as a result of it. And we don't know what the long-term consequences of that are. What if you're 60 years old, 70 years old, 80 years old, uh, you had this vaccine when you were much younger, you have some compromise of your heart. Does the earlier compromise of your heart that you had when you're much younger make it worse and make you more likely to have a negative outcome or more likely to tip over into that range where your heart's not working properly? We don't know the answer to that because of course- Logic would say yes, no. Right, which is like, <laughs> it's the concern. So then most people, like the doctors, there's a, there's a kind of a controversy in the medical community, or at least there used to be, or maybe there still is, uh, about whether or not. Um, so establishment, we'll call establishment doctors, they say it's so mild that it's probably not a big issue, but we don't know. And we can detect literal, we can detect little scar tissue. And in some cases, of course, people's hearts stop working properly. They get tacky, they get permanent heart issues. So the rate, the incidence of these kinds of problems is between, uh, it could be anywhere from like, 
it depends on how you define it. If it's subclinical, if it's just like some damage to the heart, so some elevated uh, enzymes that indicate heart damage, and then maybe some uh, clinical tests, it could be as high as uh, like seven in 300 or like 2.3%. Wow. That's subclinical. So that's not something most people will detect. But if you're following up, like, so they did this in Thailand. They had a bunch of patients. They gave them the, actually it's the two dose series. On the second dose, they followed them all with these lab tests. And they found of, of these 300 people, seven of them showed these heart symptoms. Seven adolescents showed these heart symptoms. So, and that, and that included some girls too in that cohort. So it's very interesting. It could be quite high in terms of detectable changes to the heart muscle that might be adverse. But most of the estimates focus more on like, Okay, am I having like a, an episode where I have to go to the hospital? Right. So maybe like one in 2,000, one in 5,000. You know what I find interesting about this, Kevin? Are, how familiar are you with uh, traditional, because these were not traditional trials, right? We, we, we fast track everything. Um, understandably, by the way, I, I think uh, that when there are emergencies, I do support changing regulations if there's emergencies to make things come through. I just don't think we should coerce people, but that's a whole different argument or, or conversation. But how familiar are you with traditional vaccine trials because from my understanding like if they show like a little bit of problems in a huge group of people they halt it right away yep. i don't think these vaccines would have passed based off of the current accepted data i don't think they would have passed traditional trials are you familiar with with what the thresholds are with like phase one two three yeah i don't know what the thresholds are but i know that in the past like with the uh, norovirus vaccine mm -hmm. where they have intussusception where the basically the intestine intestine telescopes on itself one of the original sorry norovirus vaccines they took it off out of, uh, I think, one to 10,000 yeah. uh, adverse events for, for, for them. And, and that's the thing is like for the for, for young men, COVID is not like life threatening for the vast majority of them. Right. Mm -hmm. So the rate at which you get myocarditis from COVID is probably much lower than the rate at which you get myocarditis from from, say, the second dose of the Moderna or say from a booster. So then why are we giving people the vaccine if we don't know for sure because there's other uh, problems you can get from COVID besides right. myocarditis. So we don't know exactly, but there's an, sorry, I was about to, there's an evidence gap. <laughs> yeah. There's an evidence gap and nobody, and I don't understand why regulators don't care about this. Like the, if there's an evidence gap, you're not sure what the, what the relative ratio of the risk and benefit is. You should pull the, the drug off. Mm -hmm. You should pull the drug off the market until you know for sure that the risks don't exceed the benefits. The benefits exceed the risks. You shouldn't be giving it to that population. This is something I believe personally. I don't know why they think they can do this. They use observational studies. They don't, don't use trial data as a result, but I don't really know why we don't you do more trials. Uh, for the polio vaccine, do you know how many children were enrolled in the polio vaccine trial? And this took like one or two, one year. This took one year. How many people? No. 4.5 million children oh, wow. were enrolled in the polio vaccine. This is like 19, what is it? 19, either 50s or 70s yeah. is forever yeah. ago. Like, why can't we do that now? Is this 2023? Don't we have like a and modern polio medical system? way scarier, way scarier. Yeah. I mean, I would hit kids and it was, I mean, that was scary. Yeah, true, true, true. But, but this is still a big issue. We can still yeah. have the political clout to do this. We just, FDA is not requiring it. And we don't need to do 4.5 million kids. We can do less and still get the same results. And, you know, if there's a question, we shouldn't release the drug until the question is gone. I don't understand. What well, so, we're doing. I, so I'll take a separate. I'll I'll take a little bit of a different opinion with that. Okay, because um, I can agree somewhat to what you're saying. But right, right. I'm much, I'm more of a like let people choose type of person. Just inform them. So I would come out. And sure, say, sure. Here's the deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's an evidence gap. Yeah. We don't know. It's up to you, but you're taking this chance. Yep. Not yeah. you have to, to go to school, to go to work, yep. coerce you. Oh, it's uh, safe and effective was the slogan that we yep. kept hearing, which is, I remember when I heard that, not that I thought it wasn't safe and not effective, but I thought, how can you say that? That's, that's a ridiculous thing to say when we don't know right. if it's safe and it's effective. It hasn't been around long enough. There's no way we could possibly know. In fact, I got labeled by other people as anti-vax, <laughs> which I'm not at all. I'm pro-medicine. Um, but I got labeled anti-vax because my position was, uh, we don't know what the long-term effects are. I'm very fit, very healthy. I think I'm going to take my risks. Uh, if you don't want to be around me, I totally understand. Um, which I, you know, and I won't walk into your business if you don't want me in there, or whatever. I, it's, it's all up to you. People like your anti-vax. Like, no, 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 no. I, I think vaccines are one of the greatest great, uh, breakthroughs in modern medicine. I'm just, we don't know. Do you know? You don't know. So why are you saying you do? It was crazy to me. I, I agree. I think that's another uh, approach that we could take that would make a lot of sense as well. Um, I do want to mention about 
you walk into people's businesses and stuff like that. So just because you're maybe, have you taken any of the vaccines yet? None? No, I took none of these. No, no, no. I was going to wait for, F- I was going to wait for FDA approval mm. before seriously. So I'm, I have a bit of a hypochondriac, uh, you know, streak in me. So I, and this, so the pandemic to me was kind of like, it was a tough time. Mm. I was going to wait for FDA trial for the actual FDA to say it's approved. Cause I know up until then it wasn't. But by that point, I had seen that it didn't stop transmission. It wasn't super effective. I had known enough people who got in COVID. I'd saw that fit, healthy people were low risk. So at that point, I said, eh, I'm going to wait. I'm just going to wait. And then more and more stuff came out. And I was like, oh, I'm happy I did. You know, so I haven't gotten any of them now. Um, all you guys, same no, things? Yeah. No. Oh, interesting. My, my opinion early on from either, mm-hmm. even the early data was because I told both my parents to go get it. Mm-hmm. They're north of 60. They're both yeah. deconditioned. They're at least 30, 40 pounds overweight. They've had other conditions before. To me, it was like the risk versus reward. I said, go get this. You should go get this. I'm not going to because I think I'm, I'd am i rather take my risk because I'm healthy. And I've just kind of stayed that way the entire time. I think that it makes sense for somebody who has two, three underlining conditions that and their advanced age that you probably want to roll the dice with this vaccine because hopefully, you know, you that could save your life if you did get COVID. If you're somebody under the age of 20 years old without any major underlying conditions, that probably no shouldn't sense. roll the dice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. I agree with that. Also, I think like, um, I do think the vaccine isn't that bad. Like, it's not that bad. It's just that there's a question in younger age and people are healthy and we need to be open about that, qu- that question. And a lot of people probably can, a lot of people will benefit from the vaccine. It's yeah. just, we need to be aware of the risks also and be just open be honest. about that. Yeah. Let, let, yeah. Let's be honest. The vaccine sucks. Here's the deal. I'm going to tell you why it sucks. <laughs> if you look at the efficacy, how long it lasts it, and it's what we, what the data is showing the side effect risk profile, not death. I'm not going crazy with this, but like people saying, I got to take days off work. I feel like shit whatever. That's a side effect. If you look at all that and you compare it to other vaccines on the market, it sucks. Like I can't think of another vaccine that sucks as bad Here, no, as no, a no. COVID vaccine. Let, let me, let me try to, let me try to make it sound better. <laughs> it, 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 it's not, it's not that bad. So, so it's true that the, um, COVID vaccine wears off between say three to six months for symptomatic disease, but, uh, it provides durable protection. I sound like I'm on like a, like a pharmaceutical yeah. <laughs> Pfizer commercial, commercial. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it does but it really does provide durable protection as far as i know many years maybe even almost lifelong protection against severe disease and hospitalization okay. and death so so that's what the data is showing now yes okay. yes okay. you will you will after three to six months you don't have much additional protection from just getting COVID, you're still going to get COVID. Yeah. So you still get sick. You're not going to go to the hospital. You're not going to die. Got it. And that's something that like, they're not communicating. I don't know why they're not communicating. Well, I'm this. glad you're explaining this to me because they're not. It's so crazy that they're not communicating. And they're just saying instead, Oh, you got to get boosted every year. Like there's, I'm just going to die. So there, there's, there's no, I don't understand why they're telling you to get boosted because the boosting doesn't actually add additional protection against severe disease, death and hospitalization. They don't tell you that according to the randomized control drought data, including like 6,000 participants, they saw no benefit whatsoever in the median age was like 60 years old and they saw no additional benefits because everybody who received the vaccine, the two dose series didn't nobody went to the hospital nobody got severe disease nobody died so why are they giving these extra boosters and then you have the side effect profile so in that sense i would say i would agree with you 100 as far as boosters are concerned the benefit versus the risk is terrible yeah i would i, I okay so yes that's my uh well that's I, where you are I now because obviously you you said two shots plus the booster right i didn't know at the time i just trusted the i trusted yeah. the, the experts i trusted the science i just took whatever they told me yeah. to take. well i got i got the answer for you i know why i know why they're still doing it you have simultaneously <laughs> one of and compared to other vaccines on the market okay so I'm, i said it sucks but to be clear compared to other vaccines that have been around for a while like polio vaccine incredible protections you know uh we had smallpox at one point that that those vaccines protected us very well there's you know, diphtheria, there's, uh, you know, pertussis. I mean, yeah. okay. Compared to other vaccines on the market, we have a very, not very effective, still allows for transmission, yet simultaneously the most profitable vaccine in all of history. That's why. That's why they're still telling people to, because this was one of the first times in history you had a vaccine that was, first of all, taxpayers paid for millions of doses. And then on top of it, government advocated for coercion 
right. that force people to get it. So that's why. That's that's what I think is well, going on. Well, and also, I mean, I'm, I just remember Johnson and Johnson getting pulled off because I was, uh, you know, trying to do my research and slow playing it. And I know this was like an experimental vaccine coming in, but I was looking more at Johnson. Johnson is something I can understand. And and then that got pulled from the shelves and I'm like, okay, like, let's see what happens after this. And I'm trying to see like how the population has been affected by all this. And it, you know, for me, it's all about being educated as much as possible and not just being like pushed into something. And so, so that was like where I was like kind of waiting this yeah. out and like not seeing a lot of progress. Yeah. Kevin, you have two kids, you said, right? Yeah, two yeah, two yeah. kids. Okay, let's talk about the effect of the policies on our kids. This is where I feel like this is the clearest, easiest thing that I think everybody should be able to see by now. Um, that we have anxiety, depression. Yeah. Um, we have uh, just social skills, uh, verbal skills, um, uh, education uh, in terms of like people's test scores. All took massive, massive hits during the pandemics, now directly connected to the lockdowns and isolation, which had a terrible devastating effect on children. This is super, super clear. What, now, were your kids, where were you at the time and were the policies keeping your kids at home for a long time like we were here? or, or And were you looking at that going, wait a minute, this is not making too much sense for my little ones because like for me, I remember they were doing mask mandates in school. I'm like, do you know how hard it is to have a, a four-year-old keep their socks on? You're gonna tell me they're gonna wear a mask all day long? <laughs> This doesn't make any sense. Were you when that was happening with your kids? Were you being? Were you like more? Oh, wait a minute. Or were you still, hundred percent? Uh, yeah. I. Well, so you got to remember, I started from the point of view of like we should lock people in their their <laughs> yes. China. Yeah. We should like <laughs> weld their doors. We should weld their doors shut and get the military in the streets. That was my. So it's you know it's a long ways. To, <laughs> yeah. That's true. That's true. A long way. Yeah. To uh yeah. So have How you seen any? Have you seen any personal uh, personally with your kids any negative effects of of the mass mandate and all the hysteria lockdowns, and stuff like that? Did stuff. You? Personally, they've been fine. Um, I I'm not exactly sure why. Uh, Ico is taking care of it. Uh, that's the, the my mom's kids or my kid's mom. Um. But so their test scores did fine, but I didn't see like on uh, Mia's like, uh, like she had these standardized test scores where it showed like her class and then it showed her progress and like her class like did like completely plateau for that period of time. Like maybe it went down a little bit in terms of their educational attainment during that entire time, which is crazy to think about. And this is like a good school. This isn't like, you need to think about just disadvantaged kids. It's, oh, uh, it's, hmm. it's, uh. Yeah, it's it's destroyed a generation of 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 children as far as their schooling. It's literally in the United States. I think they've lost like half a year of schooling yeah. mm -hmm. compared to, and then in Sweden they didn't lose anything because they didn't they refused to close down the the schools. So yeah, it's it's uh it's tragic, especially people could, kids who are disadvantaged. Yeah, did you find that ironic that the 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 side that was like that's like pro help the disenfranchised, help minorities, help the working class their policies actually caused the most damage to those people. Like small businesses got destroyed. Minorities got hammered by the policies worse than other people. And then kids in like not super affluent schools where parents could afford tutors and mom could be home or dad could be home. Like they got crushed. They were at home by themselves, sometimes without internet access. So they couldn't even get school for months at a time. Did you find that ironic? That, that whole and it might not have helped disease transmission at all or had minimal benefit as far as yeah. pre preventing deaths for those people. So they only got negatives and no positives. Yeah. And then uh, wealth got more concentrated among the top 1%. Mm -hmm. uh, they, of course, as you point out, can have tutors. So they're getting even more ahead than they used to be. Uh, while the, yeah, while the, the lower class is getting crushed and their dreams of social mobility are now seriously impaired compared to what they would have been. And, and it's, I don't think they did this on purpose. I don't think we did this on purpose, no. but, uh, but it was a disaster. You know, it's like some countries didn't do this. Sweden knew not to do this. So we knew at the time we had that available. We, we had were, that option available. We were villainizing yeah. Sweden, by the way, when this yeah, was happening. Right. Yeah. 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 We were villainizing them. We had that, we had that option available. We chose not to use it. So at that time we had the knowledge to make that decision, that right decision. We did not make that right decision. We made the wrong decision for some reason and we need to. And so this is one thing that, Jay Bhattacharya, who's kind of a leader in, in criticizing a lot of these policies, was one thing Jay says is we have to have a commission 
to uh, Congress needs to pull together a commission and we need to have a reckoning. We need to understand exactly what went wrong and why. And people who did these things wrong need to be held accountable because they could have made a different decision than they made. Kevin, let's, let's, let's talk, let's go there for a second because uh, you mentioned something that nobody's talking about that I think is the greatest danger that has come out of these policies that some people are still advocating for, which is the distrust, distrust. of the medical and scientific yeah. community, which I think is terrible because what happens is when people start distrusting, or, you know, um, these people who actually work hard, many of them good, most of them good people yeah. who are try to be objective, who use data, they don't just like go, they don't just distrust this person. That's it. They distrust them. And then they move their trust to all kinds of crazy yeah. places. Yep. I feel like that's the biggest, what, I don't know if you've seen polls. Have you seen the polls on like people's mistrust of the, of the media and the scientific community? It's like dismal. Yeah. It's terrible. Yep. How do we heal that? Because that's screwed now. It's totally screwed. So we have to have that commission, like what we're talking about. I think one thing I was thinking for a while was we should remove those people. Like, but then that would just be a partisan battle. And then like liberals would just be like, Oh, like Republicans are anti-science. They're trying to remove. Yeah. Them. Like, so this is the only thing I can come up with. I don't know if this is the only thing I can come up with. This is what I'm going to write in my next article. Um, like we need to be able to, we need to persuade those people who did all this stuff to like step down. <laughs> 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 Good luck. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, Welcome to the fantasy right thing, land. Yeah. <laughs> like, admit you're wrong and step down. Yeah. Okay, sure. Okay. I'm gonna take an L. I mean, I mean, okay. <laughs> a lot easier to lie and sweep it under the rug and just let delay yeah. for about a four more years. Everybody, we were actually just talking elsewhere. about this. Uh, was it off air? We were off yeah. air to have this yeah. conversation of like how crazy some of the stuff that, I mean, we were talking about MLK, uh, yeah. John F. Kennedy. We we're talking about the things that the government has done. That has now come out. That so. has come out. That is clear that they, that just blatantly like insane that if in the moment when it happened, we knew for sure. And that proof was there, there would be just an upheaval and distrust. But when enough time goes by, we tend to just not care and just let it, and that, and to me, that is going to be the strategy with all years? this yeah. is to just keep kicking the can down the road and denying and lying and manipulate. And then ah, five years ago down the road, everybody forgot about that. That's what will probably happen. And the only reason why I believe that is look at history. Yeah. Look at those things that well, in the past. don't have these conversations, that's what's going to be the real problem. You know, like I, that's why we need to keep like sort of dissecting this whole thing like what actually happened like where did we go wrong like we need to have these out in the open and and we need to discuss this because it is something that's going to repeat itself in the future you mentioned jay Bhattacharya, mm. and at the time didn't he get like silenced and, and there's other people too that that were like they would come out and say like hey here and it was objective they weren't crazy they weren't saying anything crazy and they were getting hammered from all angles. When you were seeing this at, at the time, was were you starting to be like, what the, this is weird. Like, why are they, this doesn't feel like a free country. No, I thought they were terrible people who are, who are saying terrible things. <laughs> oh, so you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're so honest. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I absolutely love it. It's, it was wild to me though, to look back. I remember when um, Joe Rogan got COVID and he talked about what he was taking and he's like taking Kyvermectin, which now we have data showing he didn't really do anything, but they totally talked about ivermectin like it wasn't the drug that it was. They're like, oh, this is animal horse medicine. It's like, uh, we've been using this on people for yeah. 60 it's years. It's only been for veterinarians, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is actually really interesting. The point that you that you uh, mentioned is that they're going to just wait. I don't know if they can now, though. Yeah. This is 2023. You know, we have social media now. Yeah. I think that might change the equation. That's why they want to control social media. Yeah. That's why they hate Elon, right? Mm. That's, why, that's why they're going to probably do anything they can to get rid of Elon. Uh, and that's why I don't know if this is true. You guys may know more about this than me, but like apparently uh, that may be why they want to get rid of TikTok because they can't censor TikTok. China controls TikTok. Oh, wow. So like they oh, don't want. So they're making up a bunch of stories about how TikTok is hard. I heard that angle. But it's not really about that. It's really about, oh, God, we can't control this. And, and therefore. Um, that's not the propaganda we want. Ooh, we want our own. Pro wow. I that's see. a good point. So, so, so. But with, but with but with social media, maybe we can just keep talking about this, and it, it's not going to go away. Well, so, I don't know. Well, like, yes, it will. And what what? Okay. Unfortunately, the way it'll look right. is we'll create a bigger problem. Okay. That will distract us from that one. 
We need to release the next variant, yeah, I guess. I, I mean, that's... I mean, that's what happened the, to the Killer Hornets? Weren't there <laughs> killer I don't want to be fucking <laughs> Debbie Downer over here, but I mean, that's kind of... that's To me, that would be the formula. I agree. Because of social media, it's going to be harder and there's going to be more upheaval, but... I think there's so much stuff coming left and right that I think that yeah. we'll just get distracted by something else that's crazy. But okay, here let me make this argument. The though. aliens are coming soon. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that's down the road, like <laughs> yeah. real soon. Yeah, we're, they were trying that for a while. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're shooting down balloons. That's what I think they're doing. Like they sprinkle. Somehow them, like, nobody let's cares. See what they say about this UFO sighting right here. Like, oh, that's not working. There's let's a try Chinese balloon. Else. Shoot it down. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. Um, uh, okay, let me make another argument though. And this, I haven't made this argument publicly yet. I've been working on it. I want to put this in, into this, something I'm going to write, but. Uh, and I just, I've been thinking about it like the last week or not more now, like a month. Um, it's not just the loss of public trust that, that, that resulted from this. I also think when you suppress speech, when you suppress your critics, when you demonize them, when you say, oh, only Fauci's right, only Walensky's right, only like this small number of like elite experts are right and everybody else is wrong. We shouldn't listen to them. Then you're actually preventing yourself from getting feedback Mm -hmm. for getting information that can allow you to know how your policies are doing. Yeah. Right. So if you're that's, and so science that's how science works. Science works by Isn't you put, that anti-science. Exactly. 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 That's beautiful. Perfect. So that's going into Substack. So, <laughs> it's going to go in my next cool. article. It really is. So, so, um, Science works by put it for a hypothesis, try to support it by data, and then you have people who criticize yeah, it. Yeah. Well, science stops working when when you shut down that process. I think part of the reason we fucked up so much on COVID is because we shut down all the yep, alternatives. Yep, yep, and so and so it this problem needs to be solved not just to re to restore public trust, but also to make the institutions work better. Yeah. And if we have all these problems that are going to come on, of from on the horizon towards us and like screw everything up. We have to solve this problem in order to make us better able to respond to those problems. Yeah. So I would say that's the argument for why we can't just sweep it under the rug. That's my idealistic. And, yeah. No, yeah. no, actually, <laughs> you're, you're, that's the that's um, that's been a battle for a while now. Um, again, if you look at totalitarian regimes yeah. and, and er one of the one of the things that they do is they they create the truth, they create the narrative, they demonize anything else, and then they switch it so much. This is the Soviet Union did this quite effective that people just said, just tell me what to believe. Like, just tell me what I need to think. And that is a very dangerous, it makes people very easily manipulated. It makes them manipulatable and it creates, uh, it, it strengthens tribalism quite a bit. Um, we need to have the ability to debate and discuss and to have some trust in some of our institutions. Otherwise, what are we left with? I think we're going to be left with, um, something much worse. Yes. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, like, like when Hitler came along, right? Yeah. That's what he was, he was giving them the order that people craved that they didn't have at the time. And he was, <laughs> that he was obviously. elected. Yeah. 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 That's the terrifying thing. Yeah. So, so, um, I think what you did is what needs to happen. Um, I don't necessarily think people need to step down, but I, but maybe they do. But I think if they came out and said, it'd be nice if some did, I know. <laughs> yeah. I think if they came out and I'd said, all for it. and just were honest, like, even if they're not honest, this sounds honest to me. We didn't know. Yeah. We were scared. We acted the way that we thought was best. Here's the mistakes that we made. Yes. Let's well, not make those yeah. mistakes again yeah. because that builds trust. I mean, any yes. kind of transparency, any kind of effort in that direction, I think will go a long way with the public. Yes. Yeah. And here's how we're not going to make those mistakes again. Here's the kind of changes we're going to make in order to make those mistakes. Not yes. Happen again. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But I mean, is that possible when many of those people, their pockets were getting lined with the profits from some of these pharmaceuticals? Yeah. I mean, isn't there a lot of, and, and this I'm, I'm asking, I don't know for sure. Yeah. Right? I, I, so I think so because look, I, I will forget. Actually, I have a lot of empathy for people because I was on the other end. Like, so I'm a very pro Liberty person, very, and I, I look at history and I know some of the biggest risks and, you know, to human life, which are, which a lot of it revolves around, uh, uh especially in the 20th century, uh, being oppressed, silencing speech, um, you know, putting, throwing people in the gulag or whatever, and I also know the danger of, of, of viruses and what that has posed to humanity. And my opinion was, um, tell people the risks and the dangers. If you own a business and you say on your sign, you can't come in here unless you're vaccinated, you can't come in here unless you're whatever, 
or you can, or if you own a, your, your house or your neighborhood and people learn, I'm fine with that. That's people voluntarily interacting with each other and protecting themselves and just inform us. And then let's take it step by step because if COVID turned out to be Ob Ebola or something like that, I think that the, that it would have changed. That's where I was. So people on the other end of that, I was like, no, that's not cool. I don't like that. You can't tell me that. Don't tell me what to do with that kind of stuff. But if they came out now and said, hey, this is what we thought. This is where I was. And you know what? The data showing I was wrong because it didn't help anybody. I don't, I'm forgiven, done. I understand. It was a scary time. It was weird. It was unprecedented in, in modern times. I mean, the last time we dealt with something like this was Spanish flu and we didn't have social media and technology and all that kind of stuff. So I get it. I think a lot of people would do that. I do. I think a lot of people would be like me who would be like, all right, no problem. Like I get it. So I don't, I don't think it's a problem. I think the issue is they're afraid of doing that because it just gives power to a political parties and stuff that can use it. So, so if you, I say I'm so sorry, not I was wrong. Do you, so do you not think there is a financial incentive for a lot of incentive? these yeah. Yeah, to continue to push and promote? Oh, of course. So, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, if, I mean, if your incentive is better than your salary, that's a real, t that's a real tough thing to overcome. Right. Yeah. And, and that's it's already tough. moving in that direction for you. It's easier to probably continue the lie and kick the can down the road than it is to admit you're wrong. And then also potentially cut off, a stream of income that is greater than the one that you make for your profession. Yeah, there's that. And then it's what Justin said, political fodder. If I say that the political party on their end is going to play that clip over and over again mm -hmm. and win. So that might be the problem. I don't know, man, but I, I like what you did. And I think if more people in that's in the medical community and scientific community did that, they'd rebuild that trust. Cause here's my fear. My fear is that we're in, we're entering into a time. We see this with media. We see this with, um, you know, with, with news and we're seeing it now with science, we're entering into a time when nobody's going to trust anybody. And that's, uh, that's yeah. chaos. And people will find somebody to trust. As you point out, they will find somebody they will find. And yep. it's going to be whoever's the most charismatic, whoever yes. can mm -hmm. write the best, speak the best, whatever that person will then get the power. Right. And that person will not be subject to the, the system of checks and balances. That is the government. They will have their own source of power, which is not good for right. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's that's, tyranny. that's yeah. my biggest, that's hundred percent right. my biggest fear because look, we work in the fitness industry and I know what that looks like on our end. There's a lot of shit information out there and a lot of our space is not, um, you know, doesn't have to go through lots of checks and balances. And so we're constantly battling that. I'm like, Oh, we're going to do that with everything. Yeah. You want everything to be like that? Or, you know, as a trainer, I had to like constantly educate people on, yeah, you probably shouldn't, you know, just not eat all that food and you probably shouldn't just go on a liquid diet. And yeah, the HCG injections you're doing, eating 500 calories a day, that's not a good idea. Like I had to do that constantly. Um, I, I mean, I would suck if we had to do that with like medicine and science. Yeah, that's, a, that's what I used to do constantly. That's what I was, I did. And for the same reasons we're talking about is to, uh, I was worried that we would lose authority in medicine and we would get the same sorts of results that, so I was trying to shore it up. That's why I always was a debunker. That's why I was trying to debunk misinformation and it was constant. It's never ending. Um, I know you're not in that space necessarily, but like it was the same as what you're dealing with. Um, I, uh, I will say this. I actually thought about things based on what you guys are. I don't necessarily need think that the leaders need to take responsibility, so to speak. I think if we just have a body, maybe a commission, maybe something like that, that just says, here's what happened. That's respected enough. And if we have the sorts of changes in government that we need to have in order. I don't know if we're going to get that, but at least we start with the body that, that makes that statement that's respected enough. Yeah. It won't mm -hmm. matter what Fauci or Walensky. Well, isn't that what the CDC yeah. is supposed to be for us? Yeah. CDC is not. Yeah. But I mean, we, that's what they're Yeah. Yeah. Right. We could have a commission though. That's appointed by the government that could do this. Okay. That could like make this bipartisan. Yes. And then we can maybe reform. We need to reform the CDC, I think, but, uh, yes, yeah, bipartisan, hopefully bipartisan. It's hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. crazy. Yeah. I, you know, I, 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 here's my, here's my optimistic, uh, view. Um, I remember when the internet, I mean, I'm old enough to remember when the internet like became just widely used. And I remember what it was like before. And I remember having this conversation with people, um, family members and saying the, you know, the cat's out of the bag, the toothpaste is out of the, the tube. Um, this is going to democratize and decentralize information like the printing press did just much faster. And the printing press, if you know, through history caused a lot of problems. Yeah. yeah. There was wars as a result. Yes. Yeah. 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 It took that a little long time because books take longer to print. Yeah. 
But would it result in the enlightenment re- renaissance, you know, scientific method, like yeah. spreading of, right? So I said, look, they're going to try to control it. They're going to try, but, but ultimately I feel like the good information will surface. I feel ultimately will progress. So we're still in this massive filtering process. Yeah. We got to go through these bumps and ups and downs and like crazy shit. But I think ultimately um, it'll lead to something much better. That's my optimistic. Yeah. Side. We're not going to, we're not going to like say, Oh, China's great. We're going to like suppress Twitter. We're going to like turn all, we're not going to do that. I, we're American, right? Yeah. Like, I don't think we're going to do that. Maybe we'll in the short run, but in the long run, we'll, you know, we see this as a gift. So hopefully it will be a gift and we'll have like a new, you know, revolution of, uh, in ideas and in science and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, I do want to point out one thing about vaccines though, cause it is important. Vaccines don't reduce transmission. They do for like three to six months, then they don't at all. So people saying like, there's no public health basis for, for vaccine mandates. There's no ba- public health basis for vaccine mandates in, in universities. It's, uh, it's just a lot of risk. For all vaccines or are you referring to the COVID, COVID vaccine? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. What yeah. would you, uh, okay. So I'd like your opinion on, um, what what does the data say in regards to somebody, say uh, our age, healthy individual who got the vaccine versus uh, actually caught COVID and get natural immunity? Who's that? Who's got the advantage going forward? Uh, well, it's going to be similar. I would say natural immunity is probably going to be better. That's what the data show tends to be better. Um, assuming you don't get messed up by COVID, you know, of course, it's probably safer to get the the vaccine from. <laughs> For many demographics, it's probably safer to get the vaccine for than than to get COVID. But as far as immunity is concerned, it's probably natural is a little bit better. Were you familiar with what happened with the uh, supplement NAC during that period? I've of time? heard about NAC. People okay. have been talking about this. So NAC has been around as a supplement for I don't know 20, 30 years, and you take it orally, and it raises glutathione levels in the system. And there was some data showing that it was efficacious at preventing severe COVID because it connected low glutathione to severe forms of COVID. FDA randomly is like, we're going to make this uh, prescription. NAC is no longer available over the counter. Now that it since hasn't happened, but I found that very strange. It's so weird. I, this is another thing I don't understand is like why the FDA, why the establishment has gone to war with alternative treatments for COVID. Like ivermectin is not going to hurt you, especially if you have a doctor overseeing the administration of it, you use it in reasonable doses. Um, it's yep. super safe. It's, it's super safe. There are, there are some uh, like top events. There's some case reports of, of, of toxicity. Usually it's like veterinary grade ivermectin. Yeah, they took a whole tube of it or something. Yeah. Like, like they don't know what they're doing. Well, and that, and the reason they're taking veterinary grade ivermectin is because their doctor isn't giving yeah. it to them. Yeah. If their doctor gave it to them, they're like, okay, well, you know, we know this is, and it doesn't affect COVID outcomes. It doesn't affect one way or the other, right. how well you do. So why was there this war against it? It's almost like, mm-hmm. it's almost like there was, it was spiteful. It's like, no, mm-hmm. you're not going to, you're not going to take, you have to take the vaccine. Like it's not going to harm anybody for, for people to try these alternative you know, things. It's only going to alienate them. They, thank you. It's I, only going to make them yes. upset. Yeah. yeah. I yes. think what, what they were trying to do, if, if I'm going with the, like, like the good intentions route, mm-hmm. I think what they were trying to do is say, look, we got to get as many yeah, people. Usher everybody to that one yeah, option. Like, here's what we think works. Here's what we think works. This is the best option. We need to prevent anybody from doing anything else. Cause that'll kill more people. But in, instead what they did is they actually created uh, more conspiracy theorists, more people who are alienated, more people. Who are, That's the real cure that they don't want us to have. <laughs> yeah. Like if they just said, eh, it doesn't work yes. and left it alone. I think they would have done way less damage than yeah. what they did. Yeah. Like it's not like by preventing somebody who believes in ivermectin from preventing them from getting it, suddenly they're going to believe in vaccines. What kind of magical thinking <laughs> yeah, is that? Yeah. <laughs> if anything, it made people yeah. go. It's exactly. It emboldens their other thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, know. It's a terrible approach. Okay. So, um, Let's talk about the heat that you got for writing your article and some of your position. Like, what was that like for you? Um, you know, what kind of what kind of response did you get from you? Still, that? Yeah, do you have any friends still? Uh, not on not online, of course. Like, yeah, people in, in real life are cool, especially my Republican friends are awesome. Yeah. I've got, actually gotten more Republican friends now. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> ironically, right? It was actually really sad. I mean, I have uh, I'm actually not political at all. None of my friends are for the but the first. I mean, I had uh, uh, really close friendships. Just it drove a wedge between us because of how it got politicized so bad. I, I stopped talking to my parents for a year about this. Wow. Yeah. What, what were they, were they on? So you were like super pro lockdown. So were they on the other side? Is that Yeah. Why? They love Trump, all that stuff. Oh. <laughs> it made me so angry. I would yell on the telephone. Like, Trump is so 
<laughs> man, I'm so many households. I'm sure went through that. Man, are you guys cool we now? Went, yeah. yeah, we're super cool now. Especially after I wrote the article, like we love each other again. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> what is nice that? What, bridge what happened yeah. to our son? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, what was the fallout like with, when you wrote that article? That must have taken some guts uh, because, I mean, you're you're you could potentially get like kicked out, like you, you know, or they could they could ostracize you or whatever. Yeah. I mean, for, as far as med school is concerned, I was worried about getting like consequences from med school, like getting kicked out or something. But like my editor was like, you know, if that happens, you'll just go on a Barry Weiss podcast and you'll have a different direction of your career, but yeah. it'll be fine. <laughs> you'll still be rich. <laughs> <laughs> you'll pay off your student so, loans real easily. So I was like, okay, we'll try it. Um, yeah. Like whenever I put the article out, I had like a, a, like a full hour where I wasn't able to respond to my editor. She's like, it's out. I was like, oh God. Like, and I read the title and it was like a very like provocative title. Yeah. I didn't come up with the title uh, idea. She did. What was the title again? Um, so we were wrong about the scientific community was wrong about COVID-19 and it cost lives. That's it. Ooh, yeah. I was like, yeah this, Ooh. That's spicy. <laughs> so, so I was like, I was like, like I'll be staying home for a week or two. <laughs> I, I was, I wanted to like send a message back to her being like, please remove the article. Like, um, but then I just like stayed there for, and it took me like 30 minutes or an hour to like feel normal again. Like not just, I was like literally like paralyzed sitting there. Um, and then it took like a few more hours and I was like, okay, everything's going to be fine. Um, yeah, but like basically all the people I talked to online, especially my scientist friends, uh, yeah, they think they stopped talking to me. Mm. Uh, they like unfollowed me. Have you not seen anybody? Yeah. They're coming around, come all? around at all. I mean, that that's kind of sad. I also that. have, but I do have a minority, like 5% of people like, um, uh, do you guys know who Alan Aragon is? Yeah. He's a really cool guy. Yeah, he's yeah, been yeah. so cool. And I've always tried to be very cool whenever he's struggled with stuff and he's been super cool. Um, and then there's a few other people like, yeah, there's definitely like supporters and there's definitely like probably people in my administration at my school who support it and stuff, but, but it's like sort of behind the scenes and it's definitely the minority for sure. Even the people who don't necessarily disagree with me strongly, like they see what I'm doing. They're like, Ooh, like gotta, gotta stay away from that. You like know? whisper to you, like it's cool. But don't <laughs> let anybody know we're friends yeah. <laughs> type of deal. So it's, it, it was, it was pretty bad. Mainly the thing is, is I thought I could persuade people. I thought I could talk to people who disagreed with me, who were my, like my friends and I couldn't. Mm -hmm. And that was just, I don't understand. I still don't fully understand, but, um, have you inspired anybody to, to, to come out and say the same thing? Like, Hey man, I it looks like it. Okay. It looks like it on Twitter, right? Like yeah. for a, a month after there was a bunch of people who apologize, have these like tweets and stuff. I thought it was like, great. Uh, I think, I think maybe it has impacted things. Um, it's like enabled people to think, like just because I did it, like now other people, it's okay. It's, it was a news week. I did it. Right. Like now it's a news week. Now it's okay to do it. And maybe that helped people. Um, so I feel, it does feel like the tide is turning a little bit, but, but they think, they think I'm a grifter. I'm a clout chaser. I'm making all this money. I don't making, ma making any money. I almost walked here because I didn't want to pay for the yeah, Uber ride. Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the, but it was raining too hard. I didn't want to like, come in a puddle. So I didn't, but um, yeah, it's just, is, but it's, it's all right. You know, whenever you do things you believe in, that's the cool life, you know, mm. that's like where the life is cool. Yeah. Life, like do things that are meaningful. I couldn't like live a life where I'm not doing like the authentic things. Like how can people live like that? Yeah, no, yeah. agreed. Uh, yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're preaching the choir hundred percent. Well, I mean, I really appreciate, um, you and how you communicate, um, whether I agree with you or not. Although I, I I tend to largely agree with you, I uh, I appreciate it. I, I hope more people say or do this in every um, space because um, with it's, it's a scary precedent right now. Lots of people are we're not arguing ideas. We're now just arguing people's character. It's no longer your idea is wrong. It's your evil, and that's scary. And if we shut that, if we shut down debate and conversation and speech, we shut down progress. And that's a dangerous precedent. I think that's really the first thing that needs to change is the attitudes on the ground. People on the ground need to understand that empathy, compassion, understanding that other people have a different perspective that's different than theirs, tolerating that perspective and understanding mm -hmm. that they're coming from a place that's just different and trying to understand what that place is. That's like the first step. Mm -hmm. Like all this other stuff about people admitting they're wrong, all that stuff, that's also important, but like it really kind of depends on us. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we can become more like that and more people can become like that. I don't know how to get people to become more like that. Um, I think by making it not so scary to do so. Yeah. Like you came out, other people saw it. 
okay, he didn't get, you know, crucified. I can do the same thing. So, so we, yeah. yeah. So we need to be kinder to, to each other. Yes. Totally. hundred percent. Be well, civil. Well, thanks for coming on the show. Kevin. Thank- that was, this was awesome. Appreciate yeah. you coming down. Thanks for having me.